Radio Verte presents A Hooger by Corey Zimmerman. Riff Raff. Act Two. Last night I closed my door, same as the night before. I heard a noise and said, Who is it? The melody paid me a visit. I said, Now don't get gay. What will the neighbors say? I tried my best to act real haughty. See, but that melody was naughty. Tring, 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 rings the telephone as my mother jumps onto a kick plate of an old shovel in an old pair of ankle boots. Digging the spade into the ground, she turns to black Midwestern soil, earthworms getting their wiggle on in full swing of late July. She fashions a small hole with her forearm gloves, sprinkling a handful of marigold seeds and covering them with dirt. Tring, 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 tring. She jumps up on the kick plate again, jabbing every ounce of her 110 pounds into the soil. Tring, 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 as steam pours out of her ears. She drops the shovel and throwing her gloves to the ground, stomps up the back stairs. Now for heaven's sake, is everyone deaf as a doornail around here? Receiver to ear. Why, good morning, Mayor. Yes, I'm doing just fine, thank you. Oh, yes, yes. Well, yes. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes, I'm sure he is around here somewhere. Let me holler for him. Oh, that's mighty kind of you, Mayor. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, just one moment, please. Oh, yes, I'll be sure to do that. Oh, thank you, Mayor. You as well. Uh, Mayor, just one moment, please. Oh, yes, of course. And tell Mabel hello for me. Yes, we would love to. Sounds lovely. One moment, please. She covers the receiver, shuts her eyes, and shakes her head back and forth. That man can talk the leg off a donkey. I listen to the floorboards as she shouts through the roof. Honey, the house is on fire. I'm right here, dear. No need to shout, says my father from behind his paper. Let's take a ride, boy. I drop my book, bounce off my bed, and in two shakes of a lamb's tail, I'm in the Fleetwood, flying my palm through the breeze like old Orville Wright. Walking into the city building, my eyes light up before two dozen Craig Carbon rifles spread out on a long wooden table. The mayor holds one of the guns in his hands and greets my father with delight spread across his jolly face. Mr. President, Dern near tossing my father the weapon. Well, hey there, Sam. Oscar, my father corrects him. Well, hey there, Oscar. Inspecting the weapon unnaturally, I can see that look in my father's eye when he is doing math in his head, and I know he is ready and waiting to ask the mayor for the receipt. He greets Sergeant White, and Sergeant White gives a squirrely nod before the display of firepower, an each shitting grin hidden under his bushy mustache. Five foot two, Sergeant White is rough and ready. He wears his custodian helmet indoors over his small round head to make him look a good foot taller than he is. A bachelor living with a cigar chewing Meemaw. Meemaw, slowly dying of pulmonary emphysema. Sergeant White has fire in his belly. He takes a tablet twice a day. Meemaw cuts the crust from his bologna sandwich. He has a phobia of needles and a passion for theatrical arts. A particular taste for Shakespeare. Believes Chaplin, a buffoon. A hack. Sings tenor in the church choir. Sees a whore down in Bernie Dot once a month. Tears up when he reads Mr. Rochester is gone from the house for a week. And it's rumored he may not be back for over a year. Words read to him by his Mima that tug on his heartstrings every night before drifting off to slumber. Sergeant White owns three cats named Ethel, Minnie, and Horace, and has a somewhat exaggerated disliking for Canis, Lupus, Familiaris, Linnaeus. In layman's terms, the domesticated dog and strays alike. 
Sergeant White is due to train the new civilian police force to load, fire, and clean the Craig Carbine rifles, purchased on my father's dime, a dime spinning about my father's head. Receipt, dark gone. Must have left it on my desk, says the mayor with a pat of his empty pockets and a good shrug. Hell, last time I saw you, Sam. Oscar, my father corrects him again. You were knee high to a grasshopper. You got one hell of a pop there. And that mother of yours, I tell you what. Oscar, you ever held a gun before? No, sir. I say, better not have, says my father. My eyes widen and I look up at my father for permission. They're not loaded, are they? He asks. Sergeant White opens the bolt on one of the long guns, checks the barrel and places it in my hands, in a mighty surprise by its weight, as he says, 8.5 pounds, 49 inches in length, 22 inch barrel, bolt action, 5 round magazine, shoots a 30-40 cartridge, 30-40 yards a minute at 2,000 feet per second, with a range of 900 meters, approximately 3,000 feet. Heavy, ain't it? Town dump. Marmalade jars, glass medicine bottles, liquor bottles, broken ceramic pots, chipped and broken china, peach cans, coca cans, soap wrappers, bullet casings, animal bones, and food scrapped heaped amongst blackened, smoking rot that stinks to high heaven. An echoing bang sends the cawing crows and stray mutts fleeing with their tails between their legs for the safety of the distant tree line as my father, quite shaken by the kick, hands the rifle back to Sergeant White. Oh hell, let the boy fire one, says the mayor, repositioning his sagging trousers. Removing my finger from my ears, I watch my father massage his bony shoulder as Sergeant White pulls the bolt handle up and back toward him, places one round in the magazine, closes the bolt, moves it forward and down, feeds and locks the cartridge into the chamber, and before I know it, I find the heavy rifle again in my hands. Ready to fire, he says. Point her down range and hold her steady, right between that spick's eyes. Peering down the V-sight, the barrel uncontrollably circles around the head of a mustached man in a sombrero, two bandoliers crisscrossing his chest, pointing a finger straight back at me, saying in bold letters, I want you, gringo, fighting the Mexican Revolution, and be proud to ride with Pancho Villa. Now take a deep breath, and when on the exhale, gently squeeze the trigger. But I can't center the heavy barrel between the Mexican's eyes for the life of me. Hold on tight, son, says my father. It's got a kick. The deafening explosion knocks my socks off and blows out my left eardrum, a ray of sunshine bolting through the Mexican's left eye as I shoot my own eyes over to see the mayor. A dog with two tails, smoke rolling out his barrel, a box of birds in his eye. Hell, he'd kick his heels if he wasn't so fat, the fat bastard stealing my shot. His lips bubble, but I hear not a word, only a tring 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 tring. My father curses as the Fleetwood kicks up mud, as he lets it loose, throwing up gravel and scat. Once the Fleetwood is good out of sight, Sergeant White leads the mayor to the tree line. You sure you got rid of that body? Asks the mayor. Affirmative, says Sergeant White. Not a thing to worry about. The mayor stops to kick scat off his shoe on a tree. God damn it. Meanwhile, Sergeant White lifts a shed of oak bark leaning on a fallen log and grabs a large carpet bag hidden underneath. He lugs it over to the point the mayor has downright refused to walk beyond. With labored panting, he dabs sweat off his brow with a handkerchief. Is it all there? He asks, pulling up his trousers with a cough. Affirmative, says Officer White, plopping the bag at his feet. The mayor bends forward and digs his hands into the bag elatedly. But quickly, his shit-eating grin turns to a smirk of confusion. He jets his head slightly to the side in a scowl of disgust as he raises two fistfuls of wet, rotten bill notes and shouts, No, no, you son of a bitch! And Sergeant White looks about with due paranoia in the echoing ravine. The mayor belittles him at the top of his lungs. Buffoon! Couldn't you find a better place to hide it? Flinging the valueless pulp from his fingers. Hell, under your goddamn bed? Meemaw's awfully nosy, 
says Sergeant White, chin drawed back into his throat. Mima, Mima, why you little twerp? Lunging forth toward Sergeant White, who jumps back, sending the mayor face first into the poison ivy. Mayor, let me help you, says Sergeant White, but the mayor swats him away. You good for nothing mutt, get your filthy paws off me. Hot dog, what do you say, boy? Asks my father, cruising down Chestnut in the Fleetwood. Sure, I say as he takes a sharp left on Main. Circling about East Side Square, we skid to a stop in front of the Opera House, a new poster in the window of a hooded man on a reared up stallion that reads, W.D. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation, the supreme picture of all time. Two dogs with mustard, says my father to the vendor. That'll be one shiny dime, Mr. President. Father and son lean against the back of the Fleetwood and munch on dogs, looking out across Jones Park, where a half a dozen boys play ball. Jimmy swings but misses, and I'm relieved to be with my father. Try and slug me now, bastard. I think to myself as a giant white-footed Clydesdale trots by. And I freeze as I spot Clarence dressed like a dog's dinner. Clarence, holes in the knees, hair a shaggy mess. Clarence waves, and my father says, you don't know that boy, do you, son? Riff raff. I look down at my dog and say nothing. Appease your mother, will ya? Go on and play around with the boys. They'll be home before dinner. And he gets in the Fleetwood and speeds off, leaving me standing on the curb 50 yards from Jimmy. I wonder if my number is up as the Fleetwood circles around the square and takes a right on Elm, disappearing behind Baldwin Piano. Jimmy, the loose cannon, Hollers something in my direction, but I can't make out the words. I wave at Clarence from where I've ducked behind a horse's ass, out of sight of Jimmy, who again strikes out and curses and wails at the poor tree with profanity and a kick of dirt. And with the ring of the bell, the trolley passes, the Bennett ice wagon, water drizzling out of the back as Clarence darts into the street, a Ford honking and swerving around him, nearly flattening him like a toad. Now everyone thinks Clarence ain't quite white, a bumpkin, dirty, rural, ignorant, a spawn of incestuousness, and such and so on. And word has it, his mother is his father's sister. Anyhow, I wouldn't doubt it, judging by his ears. But hell, on the other hand, Jimmy's eyes almost touch each other. And though he's as big as a hog, his arms barely hang to his hips. Yeah, Jimmy can sure knock a fella's lights out, but he's gotta lean in real close to do it. Jimmy curses again and whacks a tree with the bat after missing another ball. Hey Oscar, wanna kick bottles? Says Clarence, hole in his toe. Sure, I say, stepping out from behind the horse just in time to not get a heap of shit on my shoe. Lost a tooth, he says. Look, sticking his tongue through the hole as we walk into the alley, bottle clanking across the gravel. That dang magpie stole my tin foil ball again. So I rolled up my sleeves and I climbed that old dead hickory in the backyard for her nest. Clarence Jr., hollered Ma. Get down here before you fall on your head and end up like your pa. What? Hollered Pa. Now, with all the hollering, there wasn't anything unluckier for Clarence than being named after his pa. Not you, you dang idiot, hollered Ma. Your godforsaken son. Clarence Sr., unemployed by trade, side hustle collecting pots of piss. They sell the piss to Mr. Tuckett, who owns a tannery on the edge of town. Every Sunday, he drags Clarence Jr. along. And while the townsfolk are at church, they make their way around town gathering pots of piss from folks' front porches. Mr. Tuckett, a kind old man, gives Clarence Jr. an extra Indian head for candy, messing his red hair like a shaggy mutt. Mr. Tuckett uses the piss to remove the hair and fat from hides before turning them to leather, and for every bucket of piss, Mr. Tuckett pays two pennies. According to my calculations, the math goes as such. Just enough for pork and beans. Anyhow, sure as heck I lost my footin', and with all that dang hollerin', I snagged my dang tooth on that branch on my way down, knocked the dang wind clear out of me, and yeller, Yeller, an old sun-bleached lab that spends his days chained to the old dead hickory. Yeller slobbed up my dang face. And Ma, Ma, raggedy dress and greasy apron, handkerchief on her head, permanent scowl, one dirty face twin on each nipple. Ma hollered, what the hell you doing down there in the dirt? 
Tung plunged into the newfound gap in his teeth. Did you lose your dang tooth? Yep, I tells her. Clarence, your idiot son lost his dang tooth. What? Paul hollered. Paul. Silver beard down to his chest in a sandwich short of a picnic. Paul, high on a branch in his overalls, shirtless, long hairs coming out of his ears, nose, and armpits, searching for Clarence's lost tooth. Paul hollered, Yep, sucker sure is lodged in there, root and all. And Granny, Granny, short and squat, with her balled up fists on her white hips, speaks straight as an arrow. I could see your dick, idiot. Seeing Paul has that hole in his crotch, he refuses to let Ma patch up. And with all the dang hollering, the neighbors poke their necks out of their windows like turkeys. Taking in the top drawer spectacle, the whole lot born to purple, the great unwashed, even on the wrong side of the tracks. Later. Granny stirs ham and beans on the stove with her knotted up old hands, her tiny round wire rim glasses fogged up, underbite shriveled lips. Clarence Sr. sits on the saggy front porch in his best and tucker, and with a whistle, rattles the dags of two ladies strolling by in their best, weeds grown about the lawn. Clarence Sr., a window peeper. Miss Phillips once chased him down the road with an axe, but he told the judge he was doing a good deed fixing up her crook shutter. Clarence Sr., his words are like a fart in the wind, and he spent two nights in the town jail for public indecency. Meanwhile, up in the loft, Clarence pulls a mummified possum out of a trunk. Just when Ma, chewing on a pickle, a filthy face twin on each nipple, hollers. Clarence Jr., get down here, before you fall on your head again and end up like your pa. What? Hollered Pa. Not you, you dang idiot. Clarence Jr. is my only friend. Want a Tootsie Roll? He says. Stuck my hand in the jar right when Mr. Goosteen wasn't looking. Thanks, I say. I got to shoot a gun today, out of the dump with the mare. My finger in my ear, trying to wiggle out the last of the cotton. Oh, I love the dump, says Clarence, green with envy, as I suddenly see that girl walking by on me. I gotta go, I say, running off, making the excuse. My father will have my hide if I ain't home for supper. Hey, where you going? I want to shoot a gun and kick in a bottle. Aw, oh, come on. But I ignore Clarence and chase her down. Jimmy shouts a profanity, which she ignores his heckling, and heads south down Maine. My heart drags me by the toe, and it doesn't take long for her to take privy and look back over her shoulder. I stop cold in my tracks and kick a pebble, and with the ring of a bell, the trolley stops at the curb, but she continues on foot. Well off the square, she stops at the corner of Maple and turns squarely around to face me. I panic and step behind a large oak on Miss Clancy's front lawn, back to the bark. Now everyone knows not to step foot in Miss Clancy's yard. The hound, they call her, as she has a hawkeye for wayward kids. I can see you, says the girl. I take a hard swallow. I know you're following me. And in no time, old Miss Clancy lives up to her name, rushing out the screen door and off the porch, hammer and trogs, the best her old arthritic knees can wobble broom in hand. Get off my lawn, you little scoundrel! Poodle cowering behind. Wanting nothing more than to run up the tree like a squirrel, I swallow a toad, drop my head, and walk out from behind the tree, tail between my legs. Don't mind her, she's just a lonely old lady, says the girl, and I turn back to see Miss Clancy grumbling as she struggles her way back up her steps with great difficulty, asking the poodle just what kind of a dog he thinks he is. I ain't following you, I say. I was going this way anyhow. Well, I suppose if you're going this way anyhow, how about walking me home? What's the matter? Cat got your tongue? I say nothing, as the cat has indeed got my tongue. But looking into her eyes, they suck me right in like a whirlpool. And fearing I might drown into oblivion, I manage to say, Sure. I see you found your trousers, she says with a blush. At Railroad Street, I pause. I've never crossed Railroad Street in my life. The boundary that separates us and them, as my father says. And my father, he'll have my hide. But she looks up at me, wondering why I've paused mid-stride. And I make a sheep's eye back at her. And suddenly, possessing more courage than I knew I had, I put one boot before the other, taking that first step across the threshold. Railroad Street. The tracks. And a block on, we cross oak. 
Hustling after her, hurried in her hirachas. Hell, we skip across hickory. But I seem tense as I can't help but notice the house is growing smaller and duller each block further south. From two stories to one, from five, six, seven rooms to three, four, two, crooked, dilapidated one-room shacks. About heaps of trash, stray cats licking tuna cans. Come on, she says, taking a left on Cherry Lane. On Cherry, we cross First Avenue, Second Avenue, and Third, until we approach the last house on the left, just before the train yard, on the corner of Cherry and Fourth. I can see the P&O factory down the way, and a pair of 20-foot long skid marks making their way through the T intersection, and I think of the robbery. We stand before her humble home. The humble home. A front door with but one jarred window on either side situates itself in the center of the two-room shanty, making a sad face. And I back toward it. Walking up the dirt path past a dead leafless tree, she turns back to thank me. Thanks? For what, I wonder, having sowed my wild oats? Blushed, I scurry off, but suddenly feel overwhelmed with a sense of, where the hell am I? As the mangy felines now appear larger, eyes greener and meaner, the scent of trash suddenly so pungent. Hell, I'll never eat tuna again. Anxiously, I count the number of rooms as they grow in number, but don't take my first fresh breath until I cross the tracks, before my father indeed has my hide. A dinner plate waits, keeping with turkey breast, mashed potatoes, and corn, smothered in gravy, my favorite, but unquestionably cold. I am late. My stomach rumbles as I spy far enough into the kitchen to see that my mother has forgotten the green beans again. But with the crinkle of a newspaper, I lose my appetite, as I can tell by the glare over the top of his wire rim glasses as he uncrosses his legs and stands and walks past me with an empty tumbler in hand his mood has shifted. His silence turns my bowels. Ice clinks into the crystal, shattering the stiff silence. Where is my mother? I wonder as I run upstairs while I can. In my room, I walk to the window and look out above the maples and oaks for the low part of town. And as I realize I never got her name, I hear the back door slap, and my mother's soothing voice says something about flowers. And my father hollers, Oscar, get down here. 